Here I'm going to discuss the common diseases of the breast and then after that move on to different tumors of the breast starting with benign tumors and then later on describe the features of the malignant tumors. So starting with the fibrocystic disease, this is the most common cause of lump development in the breast and this condition is usually developing during the reproductive age and so therefore it's thought to be related to the high estrogen levels and so these patients generally present with bilateral painful breasts and the pain is usually more prominent before menstruation so the pain varies with the menstrual cycle. Now there are different forms of the fibrocystic disease including the fibrosis type where there is an increased stromal connective tissue that gives it a rubbery mass texture. Next we have the cystic disease where there are serocysts with ductal dilations and then there is also sclerosing adenosis where there are glandular cells in the fibrostroma and this type of the fibrocystic disease has calcifications. So it's important for you not to confuse calcification on mammogram with the cancer. So it's true that the ductal carcinoma presents with calcifications on a mammogram, but then there are other conditions like on, for instance, fibrocystic disease, the sclerosing adenitis type, as well as the breast trauma, which presents with calcifications. So not necessarily anytime you see calcification, it means cancer. And then finally, the fourth type is the epithelial hyperplasia, which commonly presents in female of older than 30 years of age. And this type of fibrocystic disease increases the risk of carcinoma. So here is a histology of the fibrocystic disease, where you can see that these are all the cysts. And then here I have provided you with a memory aid that makes the memorization of the features of fibrocystic disease easy. So fibrocystic disease is a cystic lesions that presents with cyclic pain so you know how the pain is worse before menstruation and then you will see calcifications on the mammogram so again fibrocystic disease is a cystic lesion that presents with cyclic pain and calcifications moving on to acute mastitis this is an infection of the breast that is happening through the fissures during early nursing and so these patients generally present with the breast pain redness as well as fever now the most common infectious organism is the staphylococcus aureus and so for the treatment of these patients treatments can be directed at the pain management so you can provide NSAIDs like for instance ibuprofen or ice packs and then one important note is that the mother has to continue breastfeeding with the infected breast. And the reason for that is that by breastfeeding, the bacteria will be pumped out and so it will help resolve the acute mastitis. And then finally, you can provide antibiotics directed at Staphylococcus aureus. The next condition is a mammary duct ectasia where there is fibrosis and inflammation of the subareolar ducts which presents with multicolored and sticky nipple discharge. And then due to the blockage of ducts, these patients are predisposed to infections. Next, we have the fat necrosis which develops from breast trauma. Now, it could be from a direct blow or it could be from a seat belt. And so one important point here is that radiographic images generally show micro calcifications that resembles a breast malignancy. So again, it's important for you to know that both fat necrosis as well as the fibrocystic disease of the breast the sclerosing adenosis type, these are all associated with calcifications. So not necessarily anytime you see a calcification on mammogram, it means that the patient has ductal carcinoma of the breast. Now the next conditions are the benign breast tumors. So first we have the fibroadenoma, which is the most common benign breast tumor that presents with a rubbery, well circumscribed mobile masses that are usually two to three centimeter in size and so these patients generally present with a discomfort a few days before menses so discomfort before menses and so in fact this uh, type of tumor has a strong estrogen 
response as a consequence of which it will increase in growth during pregnancy due to the elevated estrogen levels and then it will regress in size post menopausal due to the low estrogen levels. Next we have the intraductal papilloma and it's very important for you to know that intraductal papilloma is the most common cause of bloody nipple discharge. So if on examination you see that the patient has blood nipple discharge, the first thing you should be thinking of is an intraductal papilloma. And so this type of benign tumor presents with papillary cells that grow in the lactiferous ducts. So here let's say that we have a lactiferous duct, there would be papillary cells that will grow here that are causing serous or bloody nipple discharge. Now one other point is that while single intraductal papillomas are usually benign, multiple papillomas have been associated with increased risk of cancer. So single papillomas are probably benign, but multiple papillomas have been associated with increased risk of breast cancer. Moving on to the final benign breast tumors, which is the Philodes tumor, that is a fibroepithelial tumor that has a large size with a rapid growth. So its size can actually be four to seven centimeter. And then this type of tumor has increased risk of malignancy. So it's recommended to excise the lesions with one centimeter margins. And now the reason the name Philodi is given to this type of tumor is that Philodi itself means leaf. And so given that this type of tumor has the leaf-like appearance, the name Philodes is given to it. So Philodes tumor has an increased risk of malignancy, and so it's recommended to uh, excise with one centimeter margins. All right, I'm going to next move on to malignant breast tumors, but first I would like to provide some backgrounds. So malignant breast tumors are usually uh, developing in the upper and outer quadrant of the breast which has a denser breast tissue and so these malignant tumors are most commonly arising from ductal epithelium. Risk factors to breast cancer includes age as well as genetics like for instance mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes and then other risk factors include nulliparity, late menopause, early menarche as well as obesity all of which increase the estrogen levels during the lifetime and thus it would increase the risk of breast cancer. So what happens with multiparity is that as women become pregnant, at the same time there is an increased progesterone level that will cancel out the deleterious effects of estrogen on the breast. So therefore, females who never get pregnant since they have higher estrogen levels and they have never had a counteracting effects of the progesterone are at increased risk of breast cancer. Early menarche causes early exposure to high level of estrogen, again that increases the risk of the breast cancer, and then late menopause will drag on the high estrogen level, and so again that would be another cause of breast cancer. And then finally obesity, since the adipose tissues can convert androgen into estrogen, will again increase exposure to estrogen and thus increase the risk of the breast cancer. Now there are two different genes that are important in cancer development, BRCA1 which causes breast cancer and ovarian cancer, while BRCA2 which is commonly cause of the breast cancer in both males and females. So I want you to know that both of these gene mutations, both BRCA1 and BRCA2 can cause ovarian and breast cancer in both males and females. But then one critical difference is that BRCA1 is more commonly associated with ovarian cancer in females compared to BRCA2 and then BRCA2 is more commonly associated with breast cancer in males compared to BRCA1. So the way you can memorize it is that BRCA1 is causing two cancers while BRCA2 is causing only one cancer. And then one other way to memorize what I just told you here is that man to man. BRCA2 is associated with increased risk of breast cancer in men. So man to man. BRCA2 causes breast cancer in men, while BRCA1, 1, 1 times 2, is causing breast and ovarian cancers. Now these breast cancers can invade the local tissue so they could grow into the thoracic fascia as a consequence of which it would become fixed to the chest wall. 
And so if a patient is trying to raise the muscles of the chest wall and the breast is moving with it, then that's a sign that there is possibility for growth of the breast tissue into the thoracic fascia. It could also extend to the skin and cause skin dimpling. It can cause inflammation and obstruction of the lymphatics, which presents with diffuse erythema and edema. And then podorange is the name that is given to it because of the obstruction of the lymphatics, there is kind of like the orange skin appearance that appears to this type of breast invasion. And then finally, the breast tumors can invade the Cooper ligament as a consequence of which it will cause nipple retraction. Now, in terms of the staging, which tells the extent to which the tumor has spread, we use the TNM model, which tells you the characteristics of the tumor and whether there has been invasion of the axillary lymph nodes or whether there has been invasion of the distant sites. So now if on examination they ask you which of the following is the most important prognostic factor for a breast tumor and then first they will provide you with features of the tumor. Let's say they provide you with the size, depth of invasion, um, histological feature like there are dysplastic cells there and so on. And then one of the answer choices tells you that there has been invasion of the axillary lymph nodes then that would be the most important important prognostic factor because it tells you that the invasion has already started. So anytime you hear that the tumor has started the invasion, then that is the most important prognostic factor. All right, now first I would like to provide you some background information on the histology before describing different malignant tumors of the breast. So here is a normal histology of a breast duct, which shows you that there is a basement membrane on the outside layer. Then we have the myoepithelial layers, which are shown in red. And then at the center, right here, we have the luminal epithelial cells, the function of which is to produce milk. So therefore, prolactin will act on the luminal epithelial cells to produce milk, while oxytocin will act on myoepithelial cells, which is this outside layer, to contract so that the milk will be expelled out of the nipple. Now, ductal carcinoma in situ is a condition where atypical luminal epithelial cells have been increasing in number, but they have yet not invaded the myoepithelium or the basement membrane. And then invasive ductal carcinoma is the time where the cancer cells has attacked the myoepithelial cells as well as the basement membrane. And so from here on, they would spread to the axillary lymph nodes and that is the most important prognostic factor because it tells you that the invasion has already started. Now here tells you the difference between the ducts and lobules. So these are examples of ducts, while these are examples of lobules, which are essential for milk production. And so here, if you notice, we have a lobule where the invasive cells are confined inside the lobule, but they have not yet invaded the um, basement membrane. So this is an example of lobular carcinoma in situ. On the other hand, we have some uh, invasive cells inside the lobules that have invaded the basement membrane. And so this is an example of the invasive lobular carcinoma. Likewise, we have some malignant cells that are confined inside the duct. So this is an example of ductal carcinoma in situ. And then there are some malignant cells that have already invaded the basement membrane of the duct. And so this is an example of invasive ductal carcinoma. So I would like to let you know that both lobules and ducts are made of the luminal epithelial cells and myoepithelial cells. So once the luminal epithelial cells become cancerous and they start invading the myoepithelial cells and the basement membrane, then that's the time that they will spread to the distant sites. All right, now finally, moving on to the malignant tumors of the breast. The first condition is ductal carcinoma in situ. Here you can see that we have a breast duct and then there is ductal carcinoma in situ right there, but it has not yet invaded the myoepithelial cells or the basement membrane. So this is a neoplastic lesions that are confined to the breast ducts and there has not yet been any invasion. And so it's recommended for these patients to undergo surgery and receive radiation therapy. And then one important feature of both ductal carcinoma in situ as well as the invading ductal carcinoma is that there would be necrotic cells 
at the center of these cancer cells. And so these necrotic cells will cause microcalcifications that would become evident on mammography. And so it's important to know that both ductal carcinoma in situ, as well as the invasive ductal carcinoma, present with microcalcifications. Now let me ask you a question here. What other breast conditions that are not associated with tumors also present with calcifications? And so you may recall that I told you breast trauma as well as the fibrocystic disease of the breast, those conditions also present with calcifications. In any case, going back to ductal carcinoma in situ, there is a subtype of DCIS that is called comedocarcinoma, where there is a cheesy and caseous necrotic cells that are inside the ducts. And the way you can memorize it is that comedocarcinoma is associated with cheesy and KCS necrosis. So comedocarcinoma is a subtype of DCIS that presents with cheesy and KCS necrosis in the tumor cells. The next condition is invasive or infiltrating ductal carcinoma, which is the most common type of invasive breast cancer. And this type of tumor, due to the fibrous reaction, has a rock hard texture. And then there are calcifications as well as necrosis associated with this type of tumor. And then on mammography, you will see a stellate morphology, which means that there is a star-shaped appearance. So here the resolution is not that great, but there is kind of like a star-shaped appearance to these breast tumors. Moving on to lobular carcinoma in situ, this is a non-invasive tumor that increases the risk of cancer in either breast. So if a patient has lobular carcinoma in situ in the left breast, there is an increased risk of cancer development in both breasts, so it doesn't matter. The presence of the lobular carcinoma in situ means that there could be cancer development in any breast. And this type of tumor is not being detected on mammograph, and so it's usually being diagnosed with an incidental finding on breast biopsy. Next, we have the infiltrating, also known as invasive lobular carcinoma. And after ductal carcinoma, this is the second most common type of invasive breast cancer. And so this type of cancer is often bilateral and is more often seen in older women. Next, we have the medullary carcinoma, which is a very rare breast tumor that is presenting with well circumscribed lesions that have a fleshy mass appearance with good prognosis. And so the histology shows hemorrhage with necrosis. So there is hemorrhage with necrosis and some lymphocyte infiltrate. Moving on to the Paget's disease of the breast, this type of disease is presenting with itching and burning and then there is eczematous as well as ulcerated lesions of the nipple and areola. So important findings for the diagnosis of this disease includes the ulcerated lesions as well as itching and burning. And then on histology, you will see the presence of the Paget cells in the epidermis. So here is an example of Paget cells that are present with the surrounding keratinocytes. And then the final important point is that the Paget's disease of the breast is suggesting that there is probably an underlying breast disease, whether it's a ductal carcinoma in situ or an invasive cancer. And that concludes our discussion of the breast disorders.